That's live. Good evenings, Melbourne. <laughs> days we've had the time of our lives it's been incredible the whole way around we've had a warm and wonderful welcome we couldn't have had a better time i'm now going to introduce to you two speakers one is incredibly charismatic um the other one dribbles on a bit and it's probably not quite as charismatic but he, he does have two very important parts to his body he's got brains he's got balls Nigel down here. So I'll give you Damien Costas. Thank you very much. I was here last December and I got a $50,000 bill from the police force for causing a bit of a stir on Racecourse Road. <laughs> no, you know what? It, it wasn't the police. It wasn't the police. They, they did a fantastic job. It was um, the minister, what's her name? Neville, a contemptible puppy. Um, <laughs> but it's very interesting because I, I, when I got here, <clears throat> I got a phone call from The Australian asking me for comment because apparently, and this hasn't come up in the last two months worth of our discussions, but um, I'm going to get another bill from the police force uh, for the you know, 300 odd police that are here tonight. And what amuses me is that we've got AFL, uh, we've got the rugby, we've got Chelsea Manning, uh, there's something going on at Jeff's shed, and apparently there's a protest at the library. Um, because in Victoria, everyone seems to protest everything these days. Have you guys got a problem with library cards or something? <laughs> um, but no, um, I basically said the same thing I said um, the last time, and that is, uh, sue me. It's not going to happen. Um, and it happened on SBS, and for the millennials in the room, that's sex between soccer. Um, a man named Nigel Farage was elected to the European Parliament. And uh, before YouTube and Google and all that, and I was up one night, you know, drinking, as I do, and I saw it, and I thought, hello. He was elected with similar ideas to me and one objective, to leave the UK out of the European Union. And little did he know that this would be the shot heard around the world that would start a global revolution against the political and media establishment, and God knows do we need a people seriously. because like all statesmen he understands that politics is a contest of ideas and values and not an exercise in PR and something that our current mob here would do very well to learn. Um, so I become a bit of a fanboy. As I say, this is 20 years in the making for me and to be on the road with a man for five days has been just heaven. I'm fawning over him like a little girl on Harry Styles. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to Mr Nigel Farage. humiliated 
by this wonderful, dominant, fantastic Australian cricket team who played so fairly and straightly over the years. <laughs> if any of you are cheesed off with that, have a go at Steve Smith, not me, all right? So I'm really happy to be here. It's been a great week. Uh, I found in this country people are friendly, they are nice, you've got great service, you've got an amazing place that you live. And one of my key messages that I bring to you this week is look at your cities, look at your lifestyle, do not make the same mistakes we've made in many of our cities in Europe. outside and we saw them in Perth, we saw them in Auckland um, and we're seeing them here today in Melbourne. I think just worth thinking a little bit about what these protests are. You see, it's perfectly right and legitimate in a free democratic society that people should be able to express their view and that includes dissent. I've been dissenting in Brussels for nearly 20 years. But the problem, the objective that many of these people out here have today is not to dissent in a democratic manner. It is not to present an alternative argument. No, what these people want to do is they actually want to close down debate. They actually want people like me not to be allowed to speak in these venues. Their actions are not just undemocratic, they are anti-democratic, and if you think about what those who went before us in two world wars shed much blood for, it was for the right of us in a free democratic society to have our say, to debate, to listen to different point of views, and we must stop this attempt to close down free speech with every fibre in our Some of them will be committed Trotskyites, committed to global revolution. No doubt mummy and daddy are paying all of their bills, but there we are. And of course the committed Trots will hate me, because they see the European Union as being at the epicentre of the new globalist project. And don't be in any doubt what the globalists want, the European Union. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. I'll come back to Hillary later, I promise you. Lots more on Hillary to come. But what the globalists want, the European Union, Hillary Clinton, I dare say even the Malcolm Turnbulls of this world. <laughs> yes, it closed the bar, would you please? Just not looking at it like. nation states to make democratic decisions. They want these decisions made at a higher authority, at a higher level. The Trotskyites want one world government. They want one world currency. Some of them out there protesting me today will be committed Trotskyites. And you know what? That's fine, because actually it's going nowhere. My guess, though, is many of those out there are protesting me. And I say this because I met one of you earlier on this evening. And you said to me, I told my sister, I was coming along to meet Nigel Farage tonight, and she said, well, why on earth would you go, go, want to go and listen to that horrible racist? And he asked her, have you ever listened to anything Nigel Farage has said? And she said, no, I don't want to listen to anything he's got to say. <laughs> and what you've got out there are a group of people who are being fed propaganda. They're being told that those of us that believe in a nation state, those of us that believe in proper border controls, those of us that are deeply sceptical of signing up to agreements like Paris, they're being taught that we're somehow neo-Nazis. And where is this going wrong? Well, I'll tell you. We used to teach in our schools and hospitals, our young people, something called critical thinking. And critical thinking is you say to young people, here's a problem, here are two potential solutions, and you make your mind up which of those you think 
is the right approach to the problem. Now we teach young people, here is the problem of climate change, migration, or national sovereignty, and here is one solution that is good and moral and strong and correct, and you must believe in it because it's backed up by science. And here's another opinion which is evil, wrong, and bad, and should be closed down. I believe that what is going on in our universities in Britain, America, Europe, Australia, and elsewhere across the Western world, I believe there is a cancer now deep within our university institutions. We are not teaching children in an unbiased ma manner on the matters of the day, and I want to see strong government that says, unless universities make sure that young people are exposed to both sides of the argument, all public funding stops. <laughs> you know, I was never ever going to get involved in politics at all. I had no intention. I left school. I went to work in the metal trading business, the commodities business. I spent 20 years doing it. I got involved in politics because I could see that in my country and in many others, Politics have been taken over by careerists, people whose motivation was not to serve their country, to serve their community or their constituents. Their politics wasn't about personal conviction, it was about getting elected and getting re-elected. And what a narrow group of people they proved to be. In my country, they all go to the same handful of schools, they all go to the same university, they all take the same degree, they all become political researchers, they all then become members of parliament aged 28 or 30, none of them have any hobbies or hinterland outside of politics, they spend their weekdays together in London, their weekends together with each other in Oxfordshire, they marry each other's sisters. <laughs> choice and I could see that what was happening by stealth with this European project is they were giving away my birthright. They were giving away our ability as a free country to determine our own future and I thought the hell with this, I am going to fight these people. And that's exactly brand new party of British politics is not a very easy thing to do um, and it was a long and at times very lonely road but I never doubted for a moment that I was doing the right thing. I never doubted for a moment that at some point in time that disconnect that exists between our capital cities and real people would be closed and my opportunity came, my first real opportunity came in 1999 when the European elections were contested for the first time on the basis of proportional representation. It was the first time any national election had ever used this system. I wasn't necessarily at the time a fan of it, but I could see how useful it was. So I campaigned like crazy, I thought we could do it, and three of us from UKIP got elected to the European Parliament. I found myself that night at 1.30 in the morning staring into the television camera, blinking, having never had any media training whatsoever, <laughs> never done a live TV interview in my life, not quite sure really what to do. <coughs> and the interviewer starts, he said, congratulations Nigel, which is a clue, it wasn't the BBC. <laughs> You said you would, but next week you'll go off on Eurostar to Brussels, you will get to your office, you will find a pile of invitations on your desk to lunches, dinners, champagne receptions. Do you, he asked me in my first ever live TV interview, do you think you'll become corrupted by the lifestyle? And I replied, and I still believe to this day it's the best reply I've ever given in a live interview. I replied, no, I've always lived like that. <laughs> when you stand up to give a public 
speech, and it's something I know that many people are very scared of. Very, very nervous. You know, people say, oh my goodness me, you know, my daughter's getting married next week, I've got to give a speech, my brother's best man next speech, I've got to you know, give a speech, I've been promoted in my company. A woman says, I've got to give a speech, and people are really scared, they're scared of standing up and speaking. I suppose it's not really a natural thing to do. You've got to be sort of extrovert maniac to enjoy it, I suppose, but there we are. <laughs> My advice to people when they stand up and give speeches is for goodness sake, don't write down and read a speech. Because if you do, you're looking down there and the audience are there. So look at them, engage with them, have a couple of simple points in your mind, and if it isn't the family christening, and you get one or two things wrong, don't worry. You know, within 20 years they'll forgive you, something like that. <laughs> no, the point is when you're speaking at the family christening, don't worry, even if you go slightly wrong, because everybody in that room is on your side. Now, when I spoke in the European Parliament in Brussels that day, <laughs> was on my side. And of course, if I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say, one word that was seen to be out of place would of course be used and they'd hound me with it for goodness knows how long. But I knew roughly what I wanted to do. I wanted to say, no one knows who you are, you're not been elected, you're paid more than President Obama, you can't be removed, the whole thing is a farce. I don't know how to run Europe, for the looks of you, I wouldn't let you run a buff. That was the... <laughs> that was the basic plan. That was the basic plan. Anyway, I got up and I said, Mr. President, I said, we were told that when the new President of Europe was appointed, it'd be a man who would stop the traffic in Washington and Beijing. And what we got was you. <laughs> be rude, but <laughs> anybody ever tells you that, it means the opposite, doesn't it? <laughs> Dad, I don't want to be rude, but... Now, where the next bit came from, I still to this day do not know. I'd never heard the phrase before in my life. I hadn't planned it. I hadn't scripted it. It just kind of happened. I said, you have the charisma of a damn rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question I want to ask the question we all have asked is, who are you? I've never heard of you. <laughs> With this, a cacophony <laughs> struck up in the European Parliament of people shouting out, saying disgrace, boo, throwing paper balls. I mean, it was absolute mayhem in there and the President of the Parliament was intervening and asking me to shut up and sit down and I didn't know what to do. I thought I'd just ignore the buggers and keep going and get down. So I kept on and I finished up by saying maybe the reason Mr Van Rompuy that you want to abolish nation states, take away national identity and the pride people have in where they come from is because you come from Belgium. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether the Belgian joke crosses over in Australia. Um, Belgian folks is a completely insignificant little place in Northern Europe. If ever you've been there before, you may well have forgotten by now. <laughs> and of course, it's the only place in the world where the pigeons fly upside down. I'll tell you why later in private. The... I mean, come on, name a famous Belgian. were pretty limited to, though, as a result of my speech, his recognition rating in Germany doubled overnight. 
He should have paid me as a PR guy. I suppose in some ways I should feel sorry for him because when you Google Herman Van Rompuy and his life, and you know he's been a bureaucrat and prime minister of that dumb called Belgium and various things like that. But actually when you Google this distinguished European politician's life, all you get is me at that speech. <laughs> Everyone's gone PC, haven't they? Everyone's gone health conscious. You know, we're not supposed to eat fatty foods or drink alcohol or... And smoking, of course, I mean, appalling. I mean, smoking's been banned everywhere, hasn't it? Banned everywhere. Well, my office is a tolerance zone in Brussels for this sort of thing. <laughs> so, I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, the smoking ban doesn't directly apply to me um, or my staff. And I've now had my third warning from them. My third warning left, if you're caught smoking again in the European Parliament office, we will send you a fine. And I've written back to say, look, let's cut out the middleman, let's make this easier and put in place a monthly standing order. But I haven't, <laughs> I haven't heard that from them yet, have they? <laughs> they love me over there. Anyway, I left the office and of course they had ticked off the press corps. They told the press corps I was going to be threatened with a big fine, and of course they expected me to do what all career politicians do, to sort of go weak at the knees, pay the fine, apologise, wear sackcloth and ashes for a fortnight, and all will be well. So there they all are, 30 or 40 of them, cameras flashing away, all shouting, have you apologised, have you apologised? And I said, let them the press, please, a moment, silence. I said, I think there is a time in a man's life when he has to put up his hands. Admit he's got it wrong. Admit he's gone over the top. Admit he's caused offence. Admit he's made a mistake. And at times like this, it's right and proper to apologise. And I apologise now to bank clerks all over the world. <laughs> to be suddenly going from being nobody to being known walking down the high street and a series of mixed reactions, but hey, that's democracy, isn't it? That's democracy. People knew where I stood, they knew what I was about. I was able to lead UKIP to do quite remarkable things, including in 2014, we won the European elections. We won a national election, something that had not been done by a party that wasn't Labour or Tory since 1906, and I'm immensely proud of having been able to do that. And that was the beginning. That result, that Brexit result, and why? What a night that was. That was tough. <laughs> that result, I don't think I realised at the time, quite the global significance of what Brexit was to mean over the course of the coming years. I didn't even realise on that night the extent to which the establishment would fight to try and stop it from happening. But it was interesting that on the morning of Brexit, a private jet flew from JFK Airport into Western Scotland, where a New York property developer <laughs> and decided he wanted to be in the United Kingdom. Trump wanted to be there for Brexit. Trump had called Brexit. Trump believed in Brexit. And don't forget, Trump's mother was a Scot. Trump Fields. Trump Fields. We've got some Scots in the audience, have we? We've got some Scots in good. I'm pleased they closed the bar. That's a good thing. Um, <laughs> Trump felt it. And it wasn't long before I found myself being invited to Jackson, Mississippi, by the governor of the state to attend a dinner. And the dinner would be Donald Trump and myself speaking to Mississippian Republican activists. The governor said, your Brexit message is the inspiration we need to beat Hillary and to beat the establishment. And remember, you know, nobody gave Trump a catch chance in hell, did they? Nobody. So I was only too pleased to go down to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, to meet, I, I'd never met Trump before. We tried to meet a couple of years before. I know his people have been watching one or two of the things I've been doing. Um, and I was thrilled to meet him. We had a great time. 
and he told this little dinner that he'd begun to call himself Mr. Brexit, but perhaps with me there, he better stop doing that. Um, and we got on very, very well. It was very good, very enjoyable. And then the exciting bit of the night came. Off to the basketball stadium with about 18,000 Mississippians crammed in there waiting for Trump to appear at a Trump rally. And I was really excited. You know, I'd been in Mississippi, I'd met him, I'd given my little speech at the dinner, I'd had a few drinks and enjoyed myself, and now I was going to sit in the front row and watch a Trump rally. I was so excited, and I was behind stage, Rudy Giuliani was there, the mayor, the former mayor of New York, remember him? The guy that massively cut crime with his zero tolerance policy, amazing guy, amazing guy. Uh, maybe your police could learn a thing or two when I've been reading in your newspapers. Uh, maybe the gang culture that appears to have um, taken root in Melbourne might get dealt with. And mind you, at the same time, maybe the police could learn a thing or two in Melbourne. So Rudy was there, uh, the, and uh, Jeff Sessions was there, went on to become the Attorney General, and me and a couple of friends, very intimate crowd of people, honoured, privileged and excited to be there and it's 20 past 7, there's 10 minutes to go and everything is just great. And at that moment, Stephen Miller, who is now Trump's major speechwriter, Miller walks up to me and says, oh, the candidate would like you to speak. <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, we've decided that actually your message, Nigel, we've heard you earlier and speak to that group at the dinner. Uh, your message is so strong and so powerful and so helpful uh, that Donald is going to introduce you. I said, is something funny going on here? At that moment, Trump comes over. Hey, Gene Nigel, well done, great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. He says, your message, great stuff, very powerful, very strong. You get up on that stage, I introduce you. You give a bell, well done, thank you. <laughs> So, we've now got eight minutes to go. I'm about to become the only foreign person in the history of all US presidential elections to speak at an election rally. It has never, ever happened before. So I thought, well, I've got to get this right. I've got to get this right. So I, thought, I said, look, it's not for me as a foreigner, having criticised President Obama for coming to my country, and telling us how we should vote in our referendum, it wouldn't be seemly of me to say how you should vote in farce, isn't it, really? I want a Trump, Trump rally platform. <laughs> I said, but let me tell you this. I wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton if you paid me. I love it. <laughs> and here was the clever bit. I then said, oh, I wouldn't vote for Hillary Clinton if she paid me. Ah. Ah, and actually, that really worked well. Had a fantastic time. And the next day, midday, Jackson Airport, sitting in the sitting in the bar, CNN's on the monitor, and Hillary does a live press conference <laughs> to say Donald Trump has sunk to the depths. He's brought to America this misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, <laughs> racist. I forget the length the, 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 the of the list. And I just thought, Hillary, thank you. You've just made my future in the United States of America by putting me and what I stand for at the heart of that campaign. So I, say to people, I say to people that if, if your Liberal Party decides it's going to stick in the centre, then don't think the big shock. Don't think the big earthquake. Don't think the global revolution can't come to Australia too, because it certainly can. It certainly can. And from my perspective, one of my motivations for Brexit wasn't just so that we should be a free country, the rest of Europe should be free countries, but that we should put right what we did wrong back in 1973. I'm not somebody who's for apologies. I'm not somebody who wants to tear down statues. I'm not part of that crazy movement, but it still beggars belief that we stabbed in the back our real kith and kin, our friends in the world like you, back in 1973 by joining the common market. Despite that, despite that, there is a great love 
that still exists between Australians and British people. It's there. is the most undervalued organisation on earth. We speak English. We have a shared culture and history. We have common law. In many cases, similar contract law. There is a big exciting world for us outside the European Union you can benefit too. We'll get our relations back on a normal track. And I look back now at what's happened over the last couple of years, and I almost have to pinch myself to think that there I was, sitting in a pub, opposite the Medal Exchange where I worked in the city back in about 1990, deciding I was going to go and take on the establishment, but wondering whether it was a bit like the charge of a light brigade. And actually, do you know what? I think I was the first person out there that helped to spark this revolution. So folks, you can protest as much as you like outside tonight. We are winning and we are happy for it.